supports self-help programs through the USC, an agency with a heart, 56 Park Street, Ottawa. The year was 1945. A million Canadians were returning home from the armed forces. Their main concern? To pick up the threads of their domestic lives as they rejoined their families. Meanwhile, a recent immigrant woman took on a bold venture, that is to launch a relief and rehabilitation agency for Europe. This was the beginnings of her calling Canadians to assist the more needy in Europe. Where did this boldness in Lada Hitchmanova come from? Where did the, her drive to stir Canadians to look abroad once again? That is, to acknowledge Canada's good fortune and to give to the more needy. Well, for that part of the story, we have to go back in time, back to the beginning, and trace her development up to the age of 35 when she took those bold moves. Lada Hitchmanova was born into a secure and prosperous family in the city of Prague in November of 1909. These were the last days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And her sister Lily was born 15 months later. The family lived in an apartment building in the city of Prague, owned by their mother's father. And although the family had a Jewish background, the parents, Max and Els Hitzman, they placed more importance on social reform and education than they did on the synagogue. Their mother, Elsthener. She was an elegant and socially ambitious woman and spoke many languages, fluent Italian and French and English, as well as German, which was the language of the government of the Austrian Empire at the time. To her children, she spoke German and a live-in nanny spoke Czech. And later, the governess taught the girls French. Their father, Max Hitzman, he was born into a poor family in a village in Bohemia. And his family, well, they were stretched from Venice to the United States, Chicago in particular. So the girls never got to know their father's family but he himself was of the greatest influence on their lives, especially Lada. His friends gave glowing reports on his characteristics of hard work and honesty, wisdom and charity. When Max was a young man, he was apprenticed to a malt producer, and he ran a prosperous malt business until the depression of the 1930s, selling to the brewers in Bohemia and Switzerland. In 1914, when Lada was five, he was taken into the Austrian army and given the job of supply officer, that is to dole out those meager rations to the thousands of Russians in the camps in Austria. During those years, Lada and her sister were with their mother and their, her family. Lada's first six years of school were in a private, sissy, lady school when they were shifted, her and her sister, to a co-educational school, high school, for the next eight years. And L Lily, well, she worked so hard she jumped a grade so that the girls got to share that same bench for the next eight years. But this wasn't such... Uh, a protected environment is that sissy lady school, for the boys in those days were noted to take their pens and dip them in the inkwells and dip them in the girls' ringlets, if you can imagine. But the girls worked hard. They worked very hard and they passed with honors. And there's one um, report on Lada in those days that showed her early concern for others. There was a 15-minute recess every day, and Lada held a public rehearsal of the day's homework in Latin and Greek. For those who'd not done their work, especially the boys. But when Lily said, but Lada, can't we half the time that we spend with the dictionary? Lada said, 
there were to be no shortcuts. Perlotta's father placed heavy emphasis on education, and Lotta was quoted him as saying, Money can lose its value. My factories can burn down. But brains training in a good profession, no one can steal or destroy. My daughters will study what they like to become independent, regardless of what happens to me. So like I said, the girls worked hard. They passed with honors, and their father wanted to reward them. So he arranged for a trip for them and their mother through all the medieval German cities and up into the Swiss Alps. And in a fashion that was to become familiar for Lotta in her overseas European USC tours, she interviewed everybody as to their salary, their working conditions, and any problems they had. And she would discuss these on the train on the way home with her father. And apparently he was overheard saying, but Lotta, the conditions in our factory are the best in the country. We operate above the, way above the standards that the law, the law requires. Well, when Lotta was 20, she signed up in the philosophy department of the University of Prague, and she plunged into the study of languages, ancient French, high German, old Provençal, and Spanish. And in her third term, she went to her father and she asked if she could finish her two middle years in her four-year diploma at the Sorbonne in Paris. Meanwhile, Lily had signed up in the engineering department as an architectural student. So the girls who'd been so close, their road, their road was about to diverge for the next Five years, Lotus having spent four of those in Paris. It was a big jump for Lotta from that family apartment in Prague to the pension in the heart of Montparnasse. One of the uh, lodgers there, Hans Scaller, was a mechanical engineer on loan from Berlin. And he and his future wife Ruth, they became lifelong friends of Lotta's. This, this broad new world that she had entered, as it came close to the final exams, well, she, she studied night and day in order to cope. But cope she did. For she got first prize in her French Civilization Diploma. And in the next years uh, leading up to 1935, she accumulated diplomas in five languages, French and English and German and Czech and Spanish. <sighs> One of the other members of this group when she was there, someone who remained a friend into post-war years, someone who was 30 years her senior, Andre Mary, published poet, linguist, and translator of medieval classics. Paris. Paris was the heart of the intellectual life for Lotta at that time, so much so that she happily returned there in 1933 and signed up simultaneously in the departments of political science and journalism. For by then, she had decided to become a journalist, with later taking up a diplomatic career. It was a time of great turmoil in France as well as in Germany. And Lotta became a discreet observer at the political meetings as well as the scuffles afterwards. And her parents, they were in touch with her by telephone, urging her to take care. She didn't spend a long time in France after that, just long enough to arrange for a three-week training period in the largest newspaper in France. And when she left, the editor-in-chief wrote, that Lotta had shown the highest intelligence in journalism during her time in every section of their, edit their editorial department. Well, in the years leading up, the next three years leading up to Munich on September 30th, 1938, Lotta had the broadest scope to demonstrate her highest intelligence in political journalism back home in Czechoslovakia. 
for she may have returned home to help her father in his malt business, and help him she did. She went to the office every day. But she wasn't home long when she arranged to be a correspondent for several newspapers. This was a time when Yugoslavia, Romania, and Czechoslovakia were trying to bring substance to their petite entente, stability to their fragile independence. And the Romanian French newspapers in this undertaking were reaching out in partnership, and it wasn't long before Lada was engaged as their Prague correspondent. She also wrote for many papers in Prague. Uh, the largest of these was an advocate um, for closer relations between uh, France and Czechoslovakia. At the same time that President Benesh was trying to build alliance between Paris and Moscow in the 1935 treaty. In 1937, she accompanied President Benesh's party as he, to report on the Congress of the Petite Entente that held, was held in Belgrade, Serbia. And finally, she was engaged by the Yugoslavian government news agency as their correspondent. Oh, with all these commitments, she was as overworked as she was underpaid. But her father, he gave her soothing, soothing advice. He said, Lada, a large salary is one thing, but publicity and practice will bring you much greater rewards. Well, at this time, by this time, she had returned home to Prague to the family apartment building, and her parents gave her a bachelor apartment. But as the Nazi jackboot stamped closer and closer, life became more serious, more somber for Lada. F friends her own age lacked interest for her compared to those older intellectuals that she had shared the company of in Paris. She did have young married friends with children like Hans and Max, <coughs> Hans Scaller and his wife Ruth who'd come already in 1933 from Berlin to Prague. But her work, her time, and her energy went into her writing. For that summer, Hitler turned his attention from the occupation of Austria to the intimidation of Czechoslovakia and stirring unrest in the three million Sudeten Germans. This was a time, oh, for anybody in the political life or even on the edge of, of, of such tension and, and, and turmoil. It was a bold coming of age for Lada at 28. For not only was she writing for the papers of the Petite Entente, but she was acting as interpreter for the Czechoslovak officials who were holding those meetings with the minority German groups as they were falling increasingly under the sway of the Nazi leader, Konrad Henlein, as they were raising their issues of autonomy beyond reach of compromise. Lada belonged to no political party, but her views were plain. Britain and France slithered into appeasement with Germany. And on the day of Munich, Lada stood in tears as President Benesch read his pathetic letter of uh, farewell, announcing the surrender of 28,500 kilometers of territory, along with the surrender of the main fortification for Czechoslovakia and his departure into exile. That same day, Lada wrote a, an article for the paper oh, pleading, pleading for independence for Czechoslovakia. And sometime later she wrote, my, work, my world broke within me that day. My beliefs in world powers, in international treaties. Her time had come to leave her homeland, for it was far far too unsafe for an anti-Nazi an anti journalist as well as a woman 
who was Jewish. Yes, the time had come for her to leave her homeland, for it was far too dangerous for an anti-Hitler journalist as well as a woman who was Jewish. Several officials in the Department of Foreign Affairs advised her to leave the country, for they knew that within weeks or months that the German troops would take over Czechoslovakia. After some hesitation, she went to the French consulate in Prague and she got a visitor's visa. And amid the fleeing other Czechoslovakians, she managed to get a flight. But Paris, Paris, was this the Paris that she'd known and loved? Had she changed or had it changed? She signed up for a course in literature at the university, but it wasn't long till she noticed the environment in the capital was pro-Munich and she without any close friends. So she went to the Belgian consul and she arranged for a one month visitor's visa and set off for Brussels, where she was greeted by all her friends from her university days in Paris. <sighs> but on March the 15th, German troops marched into Czechoslovakia. But by then, Lily had destroyed all newspaper clippings and documents and letters that Lada had left behind that could have been found incriminating. And for Lada, she was in the Brussels house of Rainy Goldstein, who was already advocate in the Court of Appeal, as well as published poet and author. She found work with Rainy Goldstein and also arranged for a part-time secretarial work with Betty Barzin, who was the Belgium correspondent for Time Life. So, through her connection with Rainy Goldstein, she was granted refugee status. And with her press work with Betty Barzin, she was given a press pass that allowed her to leave Belgium and return. And it was at this time that she started to use the Slavic version of her name, Hitchmanova, rather than Hitzman, in a patriotic move to show her distaste of all things German. She also found work with Le Flambeau, a, peri a Belgian periodical. But she was unhappy and frustrated, for she was having a hard time to raise their concern to the oncoming war. Even with Germany taking over Poland in 1939 and Britain and France declaring war, somehow the Belgians thought that they would remain unscathed with the oncoming war. But on the 10th of May, on the 10th of May, German aircraft bombed the sleeping city of Brussels. German troops plundered westward through Holland and Belgium and France. And it was traumatic that morning, that sleeping city being bombed. And Lada wrote, crumbling, tumbling walls and houses, the deathly, ghastly look on the faces of the people. And already a whole nation declaring that they would not be held in, under occupation of the Germans one more time. <sighs> and alas, the next morning, the refugees set off westward by car and by cart, by bicycle and on foot. The roads were blocked, the streams were sluggish, and Lada, on the 16th of May, joined that stream with Rainy Goldstein, traveling a few kilometers a day, sleeping on roads at night, 
hoping to cross a border into a into a country that would uh, resist. And a memory that Lada said she would never forget was just before they reached the French frontier. The cars were blocking the roads, the people were screaming and shouting. But there was a cart pulling forward by oxen with mattresses on top and a woman with a pale face. And all of a sudden through the crowd, that somber, quiet message of she's giving birth. So here was new life in the midst of despair and destruction. A moment not to be forgotten. Well, by the 27th of May, the Belgian army had surrendered and Lada was in the north and it was peaceful up there until the gasoline shortage, the shortage of a place to sleep at night. And already the German troops picking up their low-flying flights on the roads crowded with refugees. And Lada wrote, I will never forget the cries of the little children frightened to death by the machine gunning squadrons. The crying children because of the lack of bread and milk in the village shops. The sinister voices of the German radio announcers reading those bulletins of the Nazi successes and the faces of the French people unbelieving, helpless, hoping for a miracle to happen. But Paris was no place of refuge. But Lada, with great hindsight, in February had sent ahead a suitcase with a coat and some dresses and some shoes. And she was able to retrieve those. On the 29th of May, she was able to get a loyalty certificate from the Director of Information of the Czechoslovak Consulate who was stationed in, in uh, Paris. But Paris fell to the Germans on the 10th of June. But by then, Lada was 400 kilometers to the south in Limoges. She was teaching for three weeks at a university uh, teaching German. They were sleeping in gardens and on the verandas of hotels. Then she set off again, south, southeast through Bayonne and Bordeaux. <sighs> hoping, hoping to board a boat for Britain. That's where the Czechoslovak government were already in refuge. For she also hoped that her Red Cross nursing diploma would get her a berth on that boat. But the captain of those chartered boats, they had specific instructions. Soldiers only, no women. But that might have been fortunate for Lada. For one of the boats that she tried hard to board, it had been sunk before it even left French waters by the German submarines. All exits to France were closing. <sighs> Hitler, he read his terms of surrender to the French army commander. And the Pétain government, which had retreated to Bordeaux, capitulated. And the terms were that they would get to <coughs> govern over the half of the south and the southeast, but that the German government would get to have the whole of the Atlantic coast up to the Spanish border, and that any anti-Nazi <sighs> refugees in anywhere in France were to be turned over. 
Well, by that time, Lotta was in the south, in a village called Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port. She was trying to cross over the Spanish border, but the Spanish police stopped her and the French police stopped her. And the French police took her back to their gendarmerie building. With great hindsight, she had sent ahead to Lisbon all her certificates and letters of reference. And she had destroyed anything that tied her to journalism. So she was left only with her Czechoslovak, Czechoslovakian passport. So the French police, they said that although the Nazis were coming the next day, they would see her over the new demarcation line uh, to a safe place since they owed her country because of Munich. And although she slept a sleepless, she had a sleepless night. Um, in the morning they were good to their word. They saw her across that new demarcation line to the village of Po in the, hill of the hills of the Pyrenees. She stayed there with a peasant woman in a farmhouse for a few weeks. But when no means of escape to Portugal happened, she went on to Marseille. And the Czechoslovak consulate told her that there were no more visas being given out by the Vichy government. So she went about dubious methods. She went to the black market and for 250 francs she got a visa to the Dutch East Indies. And she stood in line for days queuing up for transit visas through Portugal and Spain. But the final obstacle? The final obstacle was a French visa. The prefecture told her that there were no visas, but um, she, could, she, could, she could write to the Vichy government. But that night, that night, blocks of houses were surrounded by police. And anybody who, who was a foreigner and didn't have official papers they were arrested. And the next morning there was a piece in the paper and it said that all women and children would be taken for their own protection into camps. And so Lada knew that it would be folly or, this, or the swiftest way into a concentration camp if she wrote to the Vichy government asking for an exit. Just at that moment, a friend from Belgium wrote to her and asked her to come to Lumarin, near the village of Avignon in the beautiful Provence countryside. She managed to get work there as a librarian for 500 francs a month. She stayed there for a whole year, but she called it a mortifying time for the owners of the boarding house were pro pétain government, pro Vichy. But the landlady ran interference for her so that she was not interrogated or... Until the time came when there was a shortage of food. And so she told her she'd have to leave, so she went farther south to her friend from her Paris days, Andre Mary. And she stayed there for a few weeks until August of 1941 when she she went back to Marseille trying to get a an American visa when she'd been in Le Marin she'd spent all her salary trying to get visas to the United States she had been writing to her friends like Hans Galler they were already there <sighs> but to no avail she found out later the cables never got there she went to the American embassy and the consul himself saw her and he said that there would be no visas for anyone who had relatives in German occupied cities 
and she thought he was rude beyond description and his reason absurd. When she'd been in Marseille, she'd had to sell all her jewelry, right? The only thing she had left was a pearl necklace that her mother had given her at matriculation. But just then, the tides turned. And another refugee saw her and the look of despair on her face and wrote something on a piece of paper and handed it to her and said, maybe they can intervene for you. It said International Migration Service. So Lotta rushed off and she was barely walked through the doors when somebody poked their head out and said, we need somebody that has French and English and German. And Lotta was the only one to respond. Before she knew it, she was interpreting for a German refugee and writing English cables for New York. She came back the next day, hoping again to get an American visa, but to no avail. But they said, they said that they, they needed a, sec a secretary interpreter who knew Czech and Spanish. And so for the first time, within a month, with the first time in years, within a month, she had an official work permit with the, as an industrial worker with the Vichy government. And she was able to take the focus off her own pain and put it on others. She got work with the French equivalent of the American International Migration Service for about 1,500 francs for five months. The work was hectic but satisfying, collecting dossiers on the refugees and pleading, arguing with the prefecture to release them and pleading with the American government to give them visas. Lotta wrote at that time that all the refugees had one big cry on their face. Please save us. Help us to leave this inferno of Europe, for we want to live, and here we will die. Lotta herself lived in the fifth floor of an apartment building with the friends from the International Migration Service. But these were dark days. They were waited every night for the Nazis to invade. And every month, Lotta had to take her papers and get them extended by the prefecture. Chilblains and loneliness, a diet of beetroots and carrots. One day, when she'd sat, just after she'd stood in line for lunch in Marseille, She was going back to the office and she passed out. And when she came to, there was blood on her hands and her lips. Her head was aching and she had a broken tooth. Well, she dragged herself to the medical clinic that she knew that the Unitarian Service Committee had just opened. The doctor bandaged her head, gave her a tetanus shot, a tonic, and told her to take a few days rest. Well, that was Lada Hitchmanova's first contact with the Unitarian Service Committee. And over the next four years, her fainting that day in Marseille in the marketplace brought her to her life's work. But how did she get, how did she get to Canada? Well, when the Americans turned her down, Canada offered her a visa a country she knew nothing about. But she got on the last boat in Lisbon and went from Lisbon to New York, from New York to Montreal, from Montreal to Ottawa. She went directly to the Unitarian Church and joined them. She got work with the censorship department, translating German prisoner of war letters for the information for intelligence purposes. She continued to work for the refugees writing letters and giving speeches. And at the end of the war, Dr. Lada, as she was affectionately known later, was offered many jobs, many, but she decided to keep her focus on the war-shocked, war-mutilated children and other European refugees 
to help them find a future. So with the help of the Unitarian Church on Clary Avenue, she began the Unitarian Service Committee. And oh, she thought it would be about three or four years. But over the next four decades, Lada Hitchmanova spent all her time and energy educating herself and Canadians as to where the greatest need was in the world, motivating Canadians to give to the more needy children in post-war Europe, in Japan and Korea and Vietnam and Bangladesh and independent India and Africa. This was a busy time for the Unitarian Service Committee. <sighs> Lada became known worldwide by those television ads with her Czech accented voice over requests for financial aid. And many, many generations of Canadians remembering her for her television and radio announcement of 56 Spark Street and that red hair of hers and that olive green uniform that people wanted to know why did she wear that uniform. But aid workers in the 1940s, that's what they did. They wore those uniforms. Hers was a busy life, caring for all the needy. She never married, she never had any children. She was obsessed by those images she saw on her overseas tours. She wrote that it made it difficult to sleep at night, difficult to forget. Hers was a life well lived, putting her values to work every day. So where did the boldness in Lada Hitchmanova come from? Where did her drive to stir Canadians to look abroad once again when they'd only returned home? I, th I hope today that I've encouraged you, <laughs> made you a little bit curious to delve into Lotta's story. There is so much more.